communication resources and faster and more reliable technology. Higher performance communication resources. So, uh, and faster first things first, can you all hear me? Yes, okay. So I'm, I've got a confession to make. I'm a real noob when it comes to doing like PowerPoint stuff. So I haven't actually gotten this to display without the little doodads on the top. But I mean, the information's up there. And we have a pretty big screen. So I'm just going to kind of go with it. Um, you're going to see me doing this a lot, though, because like I don't have a copy. Oh, I have an update. What's up, man? I got it. In fact, if I just kind of like go down here, I'll just take peeks when necessary. But so this is like a talk kind of about pineapples. Not pineapples, I can't really say that. But the kinds of like wireless attacks that involve uh, spinning up like a, a like a rogue access point that's like either like a like a spoof of of a legitimate access point or just tricking one way or the other uh, some kind of 802.11 enabled device to connect to a malicious AP and then pwn the hell out of it. So there are two kinds of rogue access point attacks that you really see a lot. Uh, the first one is an evil twin attack. An evil twin attack basically involves uh, you know, making like a, like a copy of a legitimate access point. And karma attack is one that, you know, basically what you do is you, well, we'll go over that later. <laughs> Let's go over evil twin attacks. So free Wi-Fi. So imagine we're in this situation, right, where, you know, we're kind of broke. We really, really want to use the internet, though, but we're really cheap, and we don't actually, you know, want to invest, like, the $5 it is at Starbucks to get Wi-Fi access. So, you know, we're sitting there, and we're surrounded by people, and they all, you know, seem to be connected, and they're doing their thing, and we're like, gee, wouldn't it be nice if we had, you know, some creds for, like, the login portal that they had so that we could go about doing our thing? Uh, well... I re whoa. I'm doing the thing again with the... Okay, I'm actually going to go stand down here. Okay, imagine a scenario where, you know, we're at Starbucks, and we notice that the, uh, the, the network at Starbucks has an SSID Starbucks Wi-Fi, and it's running on channel 6. And there are all these people connected to it, and they're all connected to this, this, this open access point on channel 6. And, uh, you know, what would happen if we were to spin up um, our own access point uh, with the same SSID and the same channel as the legitimate one. Well, what would happen, so, you know, provided that our signal strength was as strong or stronger than the legitimate one, all those connections would drop and connect to ours. And what that would allow us to do is, is create what that allows us to do is create a man in the middle situation, right? So all these guys have dropped off of their legitimate connection. They're now connected to us. Uh, we can start routing their packets, you know, using IP tables or something like that to the internet. And meanwhile, start, you know, sniffing creds and, and, and we can get those, like, basically Gmail credentials, anything we wanted. I'm not supposed to stand in front of the speaker. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so we do that. And... Dude, that would be awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs> I was thinking, like, is there a way I can clone myself and just kind of put myself here and there at the same time? But I think this guy's self up. Okay. He, he is my evil. Well, I guess I can stand here. No feedback. What's up? The, I, th I think that's the, either the CTF or the fencing competition. Stand here. So it looks like there's this like really, really specific spot where I have to stand where I'm not in front of the speaker and I'm not in front of the projector. So I'm just going to plant myself here. Uh, can we go back one slide? Thanks. Yep, perfect. OK, we're going to start this over because that was crap. Um, <laughs> so let's imagine a scenario. It's a Sunday morning, and you know, we really want to access the internet. And we're, we're chilling in Dunkin' Donuts. We're not actually doing anything in Dunkin' Donuts. We're just kind of lo you know, loitering there. And we really want to use their Wi-Fi. We can't use their Wi-Fi because there's a captive portal there where you have to enter in, like, you know, a, like a username and password kind of thing that you only get uh, if you, you know, spend five dollars for a cup of coffee. So, uh, what could you do? I mean, you could do something where you like art poison the router or something like that. You could connect to it and then, you know, set up the man in the middle with like an art poisoning attack or something like that. And doing that, 
start intercepting traffic and, and you know, steal the creds to, to the captive portal that way. Uh, unfortunately, I mean, that, that is like a tried and tested method, but, you know, it really, it really messes up your throughput. It's really, really noticeable. I mean, if someone's doing something like that, it's, it's kind of loud. It's just sending, like, our requests all over the place. But the point is, there are better ways to do it. Um, if you notice here, I know this says Starbucks, pretend it's Dunkin' Donuts, but, um, so, like, let's say that Dunkin' Donuts is running Starbucks Wi-Fi on channel 6. So, uh, it, it's, I don't know. <laughs> They're running Starbucks Wi-Fi on channel 6. And, you know, what, what, would, what would happen if you were to spin up your own access point, you know, using, like, an external, like, wireless card or something like that, uh, with your laptop, also with SSID set to Starbucks Wi-Fi on channel 6? How would those connected clients be able to tell the difference between your access point and theirs? Well, they can't. So, provided that your, your signal strength is, is just, you know, like, so stronger, strong enough that it's more efficient for those clients to connect to you as opposed to the legitimate access point, they will. And that's actually not that hard to do. Uh, next slide, please. So, as you see, what will happen is that, you know, if you were to spin up that, that, that spoofed access point, that, that, that clone, all these clients would drop their connections and suddenly connect to your thing. You can then assign them IP addresses, uh, start routing their traffic through, like, SSL strip, um, you know, whatever, and at that point, you'd have your, your nice little creds without having to, you know, purchase, like, a $5 beverage. So, let's go to the uh, next one. So, what are the advantages to this kind of attack? Well, it's actually relatively easy to perform. You just need something that's capable of making, like, a hotspot, more or less. Uh, you can just download host APD, and with, with relative ease, you can, you can, like, write a script or something like that that, that does this kind of thing. Uh, it's also really targeted, so, I mean, this is kind of ideal within, like, a red team situation where you, you don't want to attack, um, you know, clients that are connected to some other dude's network. Uh, you know, in this situation, you can, you can actually pinpoint, um, I want to specifically attack this open network, and you won't have issues with, like, you know, people from, like, I don't know, the, uh, the fencing competition next door coming and connecting to your, <laughs> to your thing. Um, I guess next slide. Cool. Uh, what are some disadvantages? Well, out of the box, it does not work against uh, protected WPA networks because, you know, you can't, without having that pre-shared key, you can't really, like, spin up an exact copy of this thing, and, and these things will be associated to this WPA network or, or even WEP network, and you won't really be able to impersonate it and get them to connect to you. What you can do, though, what you can do is you can, you can sniff for, um, well, basically, every single 82.11 device. Uh, has like a list of preferred networks, right? So let's say that you've connected once to um, AT&T Wi-Fi, Barnes & Noble. You know, your, 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 your phone now has that saved in its list of preferred networks. And then let's say you go home and then you collect to, you know, you connect to your Wi-Fi network, uh, Jimmy's Wi-Fi or whatever. That, that's also going to be in your, in your preferred network. So, in those preferred networks. So your, your device is constantly going to be sending out uh, like probe requests for these preferred networks, which you can listen for and use this to compile a list of, of um, you know, commonly preferred networks for basically every device around you. Because let's say you're surrounded by wireless devices and they're all sending out these probe requests, you can kind of find one that they all have in common. And that's what you do here. So if, if all these devices are connected to this WPA network and, and you, you can just are sniffing and trying to find, sniffing for their, their preferred networks, and you find one that they have in common, you can then de-auth the WPA network that, that you're targeting. And then when they all drop, the ones, you know, you, you'd spin up a, an evil twin of this, uh, this common preferred network, all the devices would connect to you, and then you pwn them, basically. Uh, so, I guess, next slide. So how do we t detect this stuff? Well, um, in most cases, you know, there, there, there's really two cases. I think we should go to the next one, two, I think. Yeah. So, I mean, there, there are two ways to, like, detect. I mean, there are two scenarios, right? The first scenario involves someone spins up an evil twin, um, you know, and, you know, they, they, they've set their SSID to match uh, a legitimate access point on, on your network, and they set up their, uh, their channel to match a legitimate access point um, on your network. So they, they, they spoofed it using an SSID and channel. So, you know, if, if this happens, they're going, to be, they're going to be sending out probe responses to uh, devices that are currently associated or, or that are, you know, have, that, have your network in their preferred network. So, just how devices uh, send out probe requests for, for networks, the access points send out probe responses. And you can listen to those probe responses, and they'll have the, um, the, the channel the, the AP is running on, they'll have the SSID as well as the BSSID, which is kind of like the, it, it's like the hardware address kind of thing. I mean, sort of. <laughs> so, um, so, you know, assuming that the attacker does not spoof 
uh, his or her, her MAC address or, or, and, and, and also VSSID. Um, you know, and uh, basically if, if an evil twin shows up and you start seeing packets uh, that, are, that are probe responses to one of your access points and it has the, the, uh, um, an SSID and channel that is, you know, matching yours, but the BSSID is not matching one in like a whitelist, basically, of, of uh, access points that you know are within your network. Then you know something fishy's up. And if we go to the next slide, there's a diagram here of how that would work. So you'd have like a, a, a packet sniffer, and you're sniffing, for, uh, you're sniffing for, for probe responses from different access points. And at some point, you start seeing one that, you know, you, you basically say, is this BSSID allowed? And if it's not allowed, then you kind of, at that point, start sending like alerts to the system uh, and maybe like also you can start de-authing that, that uh, access point by its, you know, BSSID. And that would cause anything that did connect to it to drop and kind of potentially save your, your clients from uh, abuse in that way. Uh, next slide, please. So why doesn't this always work? Well, there really isn't anything stopping an attacker from spoofing their BSSID too. So if the attacker actually spends the time to, um, you know, cover their, their BSSID and, and match, they, they actually listen for, they, they scope out your network and figure out, um, figure out how to like spin up an evil twin that matches one of your access points by SSID, BSSID, and channel. At that point, whitelisting will not work because there's like really no way to differentiate using whitelisting uh, between a legitimate access point and also one that is kind of like a, a, an evil twin. Uh, there is a way around this though. And, uh, Yes. So how do we get around this? Paying attention to signal strength. Suppose that I have an access point right here at the front of the room, and I, it's just kind of chilling here, and you know, it's serving up uh, some arbitrary network name, free Wi-Fi, we'll call it that, and it's running on channel two. Um, so, you know, let's say some some sketchy dude in like a like a DefCon T-shirt or something like that kind of rolls into the parking lot outside the, uh, you know, outside the convention center. It has like gets up this really huge like high gain antenna. And, you know, makes this, starts making this, uh, this, you know, evil twin of, of my access point, right? And he actually t takes the, the care to uh, spoof it by BSSID, SSID, and channel. Well, you know, if I was, like, listening for packets, right? We had a, a packet sniffer in the corner of the room there. Um, and we established, like, that the, the signal strength coming from my access point should be radically different from, of, from the signal strength coming from the attacker's access point. So in other words, the signal strength coming from, if, you know, Access points don't move around very much. I mean, sometimes, I guess, like, hypothetically, someone could grab one and try to, like, walk off with it. But, uh, yeah, access points don't move much. So if we, if we listen, um, if, we, if we have a fixed access point and a fixed uh, packet sniffer, like, that's kind of being used as an IDS, and we, we, can, we can establish a baseline signal strength from the sniffer to that access point um, over time. And then when someone, pick, you know, basically spins up a, an evil twin of it, you'll start seeing packets that, you know, deviate from that, from that threshold by, like, a certain amount. And that's how you know that something fishy is up. At that point, I guess you can't really, you can't really, like, start, you know, launching the auth packets and stuff like that. But what you could do is you could, at this point, know that something, something strange is going on and you could actually take action accordingly. So I guess the next, I guess I kind of blew past those, didn't I? <laughs> uh, I guess next slide, too, yeah. A little more, a little more. Demo time. Okay, so let's try this out. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's gonna go. Uh, oh, okay. So this is gonna be interesting. Okay. Yeah. You do that. <laughs> so so for this, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be using a kind of like a gutted version of this. Uh, it's it's a it's a pretty notorious uh, suite of tools for running um, uh, rogue access point attacks. It's called the MANA framework. And we've kind of removed the stuff that would make this actually pwn stuff. It'll, f it'll spin up an access point and it will behave like kind of like a, like a very, very almost rogue access point kind of thing. Uh, but it's, it's not actually going to do that. So we're going to and we're also going to run a tool that actually kind of follows this algorithm that we just described. And I'm going to do something where I move this over here. Do, do, do. Oh. Bear with me. Okay. 
Yeah, I lost my mouse too. Oh, there's my mouse. Cool. Bump font size. Can you see that? Can anybody not see that? Easily. A little small? Okay. I'll, uh, realistically, I just need a longer neck. I'm I'm actually like pretty wired in heavily here. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm actually gonna spin up two new terminals and I'm going to just kinda start this over really fast. I'm so sorry. Yeah, I just I can't see it when we do that thing, so So if we run this thing So uh, two hackers walk into a bar, and uh, and one of them has a rogue access point. Yes. Uh, cool. So what we're now doing is we have a. Um, we're running this this sniffer here, and it's it's searching for. Um, uh, I lost my mouse. Okay, so hypothetically, this is this is technical demo worst case scenario. Um, what would be happening is that uh, suppose that there was an evil twin up here. What would be happening is you'd start seeing um, some some output on there that would say. Uh, you know, it would say um, blah blah blah, evil twin detected, and uh, oh my god. Um, so it would say evil twin detected, and it would um, start like de authing it basically. Um, so having AV issues at the moment, so it's probably this is not gonna really go back to it. We'll just go back to the PowerPoint slides. So let's uh, talk about karma attacks. I want to try it again. <laughs> All right. So uh, let's talk about karma attacks. So karma attacks are kind of the, um, it's, it's a slightly more sophisticated kind of rogue access point attack. The way a karma attack works is that, um, you know, we, we talked about how if you have an, a, a, um, a wireless device that's constantly sending out requests for its preferred networks, uh, probe requests, you know, saying, basically saying, are you there? Can I connect to you? So what a, what a rogue AP will do if it's launching a karma attack is it will respond to all of these re requests promiscuously. It will, you know, it, let's say that you know I'm, an, a, I'm a rogue AP and I'm doing a karma attack. If I receive a, 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 a request for a probe request for Starbucks Wi-Fi, I'm going to say yes, I'm Starbucks Wi-Fi. If I receive a probe request for uh, ATT Wi-Fi, I'm going to be like, yes, I am ATT Wi-Fi, and I'm going to respond to these no matter what um, you know SSID and channel I get. So. Uh, the result of this is that any any device nearby, it's kind of like like a frag grenade, I guess, like in terms of like wireless things. You, you just turn this thing on, um, and any device nearby that's sending out these probe requests, uh, in, in, in in theory, what happens is that these things connect to you uh, because you're responding to all their probe requests this way. This way. So uh, right. So here we have the diagram. Basically, you you have this uh, this client one. It you know sends out this request. I'm looking for Linksys. The rogue AP is like, yes, I'm Linksys. Go ahead and connect to me. And then uh, client two is like, I'm looking for ATT Wi-Fi. So the rogue AP at that point is like, yeah, that's me. I'm ATT Wi-Fi. Connect to me, bro. So then the client two connects. Uh, client one at the bottom actually should say client three. I don't know why that says client one, but let's pretend it's client three. So client one or client three says, I'm looking for end site surveillance van. So you know, yeah, the rogue AP says, yeah, that's me. Where's White Castle? Let's go. So the connection happens and. In this case scenario, all three of these clients would get pwned um, because they they connect to it. So uh, let's go to the next slide. And so the advantages of, of these kinds of attacks uh, over over evil twin attacks are that you know for one thing, you know they're really easy to run. You just start up the script. All you need is a script that, that does this kind of thing. Um, it, it brings it up, and you, you have this this thing running a karma attack. And it's just at that point you can just fire and forget. It's you just kind of like run this thing, and you can just kind of be driving down the road or something like that with your device. A cough, cough, pineapple. Um, 
and, and things will st nearby will start being forced into connecting to your device and, you know, magic happens. Uh, the disadvantage is, is that it's messy. You know, it's, it's really difficult to target a specific network with this kind of thing. Um, if you go to the next slide, it's... Uh, you can't really do that that way, um, unfortunately. Uh, that, that, is, that is a downside, because you can't... If you have a WPA protected network, and this is one argument for having, you know, using WPA or something like that, is that it's not really as susceptible to that. Uh, you, you aren't really able to do this kind of thing. What you can do, though, is you can uh, force cl connected clients to disassociate with the WPA key. And at that point, uh, you can have something spinning. Y if you ha know what their preferred networks are, you can spin up a spoof of that. Or even in this case, when you're, you know, when you're doing a karma attack, if they're disassociated from whatever it is that they were connecting to, think all the times you've been dropped from the Wi-Fi at some security conference, um, basically what will happen at that point is that it will just kind of like connect to whatever's available, in this case, your, your pineapple or, or rogue AP script or whatever. But um, the disadvantages to this is that, well, it's easy to detect. You know, for, for one thing, a, um, you know, a, a, an access point should not respond to probe requests for multiple you know, uh, ESSIDs. That, that just shouldn't happen. Um, so if you look for that, it's really easy to, uh, to, to see. If we go to the next slide, uh, that actually brings us to how to detect these things. So. Um, Basically, let's say that you want to look for, um, uh, for, for devices that are doing karma attacks. A really good scenario is to think about is like, I mean, so if, if you were to walk into a room, you know, let, let's just imagine you walk into a bar, because we like bars. Um, so you walk into a bar, and you're looking for this guy named Jason. And you walk in, and you just kind of shout out, hey, is anybody here named Jason? And this sketchy dude in a DEF CON t-shirt in the back just kind of like, yeah, I'm Jason. And uh, you might be inclined to believe him, because like, why would he lie about that? But let's say that you're not actually going in there looking for a guy named Jason. You're a professional bullshit detector. This is what you do. So let's say, you know, you back out. You walk back to the bar again, and you're like, hey, is anybody here named Jason? The guy says, yes, I'm Jason. And so you're like, kind of write it down. This guy says he's Jason. Then you do it again. Is anybody here named Bob? Yeah, I'm Bob, says the same guy. Well, now you know something's up, because this guy has responded to the same question. What is your name? Or is there anybody here named, named this person? the same answer, and it's contradictory. And the same is true with rogue access point attacks, or rogue access points. If you have a rogue access point that's running a karma attack, um, it will respond to uh, arbitrary, you know, re requests for, uh, probe requests for, for networks, for, for, for various SSIDs. And what this means, if we go to the next slide, uh, you know, let's say we can have like an IDS, like a little device or something like that, that sends out um, a, a probe request for some random ESSID, just a string or something like that. And the rogue access point at that point would, would respond, yes, that's me, even though it's like this nonsensical ESS ID, which probably we'd never see. Um, at that point, your, your, your device can send out another arbitrarily crafted um, uh, probe request for another one. Meanwhile, keeping note that this, this thing has responded to the previous one. The rogue AP at this point would respond in exactly the same way. At this point, you have overlap where, where there shouldn't be. You have a device that has responded uh, to requests for two different SS IDs. At this point, you just take down the name of the BSSID and, 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 uh, and channel, and you can just de-auth it until it no longer works. So time for another demo. So we saw how well the last one went. So uh, we could do a live demo. Does anybody want to be a karma? No, we're not going to do that. <laughs> so I guess uh, go to the next slide, see what's up with that. So existing solutions. Um, so if we go to... So like Air, um, Aruba Networks makes this thing called an Airwave. It, the list price for it is, uh, well, it's a software license for 20, you can put it on 25 devices, and it will kind of do this kind of thing uh, really cheaply. Um, did I say cheaply? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to say cheaply. It, but it'll do this thing really well, but it's, as you can see, it's probably like out of the price range of someone who just, I mean, I mean think about it. How many enterprise networks do you know? I mean, when was the last time I went to a security conference and they actually had like actual rogue AP protection? They don't, because, you know, it's, it's priced at a, at a point where it's almost a luxury item. You know, there's so much stuff that has to come first. Um, if we look at uh, Cisco's, they have the Aeronet 600 series. They're actually like wireless access points that will kind of like also be able to detect this kind of thing. Once again, it's, it's doable if you're like a large enterprise and you can afford this kind of thing, uh, but it's out of the hands of like your average, you know, just kind of like small sysadmin or net, net admin or whatever. 
Um, and Fluke Networks, they make this thing called an Air, air Magnet Wi-Fi Analyzer Pro. If you ever see, see somebody like, kind of like nervously walking around with a Spectrum Analyzer and on their tablet or something trying to find access points, that's probably what they're using. That's like $4,000 for a software license. So it's honestly pretty inaccessible to a lot of people. But you know, what are the bare minimum resources needed for effective rogue access point mitigation? Well, um, basically, you can use the, the scripts that we were totally able to run today. Um, you know, <laughs> they're available online, you can try them out. <laughs> but uh, you can use the scripts that we were totally able to run today uh, and run like on a, on a Raspberry Pi or something like that. And you know, at that point, you've, you've basically taken your cost of rogue AP protection down to um, like $60 a unit, the, the, the cost of actually putting one of these together. Uh, and, and, and that's a really good thing because it means that if, if you have um, this, this kind of, if, if you kind of take this do-it-yourself approach, you can uh, open up rogue IP protection to, uh, well, nonprofit conferences, stuff like that. So uh, the, our totally awesome proof of in the next slide, it's the, yeah, so that's just the next one. Right, so if you want to try out this stuff, because we all saw how like, awesome it works and stuff. Uh, it's on GitHub. Um, currently it's having some, some, some issues compiling on certain distros and stuff like that, but I'm working on that. But uh, yeah, it's, you, can, you can do this kind of stuff with you know, 400 lines of Python. That's all it takes, really. And that's, that's basically it, yeah. Any questions? What's up? Is he I uh, actually couldn't hear you, sorry. The um, antenna strength for the, uh, for what? Um, it seems to be sufficient, actually, especially when you consider that the, uh, you can basically use the same hardware to, to launch a uh, rogue AP attack. Uh, you know, you, you actually, there's just a common misconception that, um, so you might want a more high power antenna in some, in some case, situations. So for example, like, just strap a Yagi antenna on it or something that's actually less directional and kind of go from there. But yeah, it should be. Uh, anything else? It is. Yeah. So um, it, dep it depends on what you're looking for. If you're looking for karma attacks, it will actually use that algorithm that we described. Uh, it will, it will uh, craft, uh, pro, you know, kind of like nonsensical uh, probe requests and send them out. And if it starts seeing responses to that, it'll take action. It'll notify you, uh, do the auth, stuff like that. Uh, for evil twins, um, it will actually, uh, you know, do the thing with a single strength. It will, it will also, uh, you know, you can, you can make a whitelist. So you just like literally just load up a bunch of like, you know, BSSIDs into uh, a text file and it reads that and then you just run it and it, that's it. So, what's up? Uh, so for that, what it does is that it um, establishes, so you run it for about like a couple minutes and it establishes a baseline signal strength um, coming from the device in, on which you're running it to the particular AP that you're running or that you've listed in there. And then if suddenly it starts receiving packets that are supposedly coming from your access point, but the signal strength is deviating by a certain threshold by, and you can set the threshold, but it shouldn't move around too much from that, from that, from that baseline, then you know something fishes up, and that's how it detects that. What's up? Yes, big shout out to Scapy. Scapy is an amazing Python library for networking uh, wireless, all of it. It basically allows you to craft arbitrary packets, uh, and, and that's that's amazing. I mean, you can literally encapsulate like an art packet inside of like a TC, like or encapsulate do, do things backwards, basically. I mean, it, it doesn't it doesn't have to make sense. You can do it. Um, also, using uh, multiprocessing, you know, it's actually a library called multiprocessing. But that's it, basically. Not not too many external stuff, but two major major external libraries. Uh, anything else? Nothing? 
Yes. Bad weather, bad weather. So, you know, it's kind of a proof in the proof of concept uh, stage right now. But I, I think that one thing that would be r really good to add, and if it's open source, if anyone wants to contribute to this, uh, actually knows anything about kind of calculating for this kind of thing, um, there there should be some way to, to to compensate for environmental factors that that you could add. But yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Works pretty well inside, though, which is cool. Sure. Huh. That's super cool. I wonder if it's copyrighted. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, so what's up? Um, because, well, for one thing, uh, that's a good question. And what you'll notice that if you if you actually open up like a packet analyzer or just even just like run like arrow dump or something like that, um, the TX values or, or you know basically your signal strength is going to fluctuate uh, between each re request. So the question at that point becomes, how much leeway do you want to give these packets in terms of like a variation in, in signal strength? Um, you know, how do you how do you know what the signal strength should be, and then how much leeway do you want to give it? You know, because if, if it's if 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 you're running an access point and the um, the signal strength is fluctuating by like you know maybe like 10 dBi or something like that, how do you know it's going to be that? It, it could be something different depending on the scenario. So, uh, but the problem is like there's always variation, and you never really know. It's 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 really hard to know up front. How much variation is going to occur? What's up? That's super exciting. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You sir sound like an engineer, and this excites me because you want to contribute to this. So <laughs> I'm just going to say yes to that. <laughs> What's up? I, I would have to. Huh, that's a really good point. I would actually have to talk to somebody who knows more about VPNs and stuff because I really. But I'm gonna guess you do. So. Case in point, or um, moral here: use a VPN if you're connected to open networks. Always. <laughs> Anything else? That's it. No problem. <laughs>